Hi class, welcome back to our discussion about culturalism into cultural studies. So on Monday, we have talked about um, the first part of this chapter, and we covered the work of um, Richard Hoggart. And for today, I'm going to continue and we're going to talk about the work of Raymond Williams, um, E.P. Thompson, as well as Stuart Hall. All right. Let's uh, start with the first one, which is uh, the work of Raymond Williams. So uh, who is he? He is actually a very influential scholar in the field of cultural studies. So he was born into a Welsh working class family. And this matters because the, his background really influenced his understanding of the concept of culture and his criticism towards a uh, Levicism idea of culture as the best or belonging to only the minorities or the group of people who have the means to educate and to um, write or to even understand or interpret the best of what that is. Now, um, later on as an academic, he taught drama at Cambridge University. And this is a very prestigious university um, and it was considered as a leap in class from having a working class background to become a professor at Cambridge University. Some of his key ideas include um, his theory on the analysis of culture, the concept of the structure of feelings, as well as the three levels of culture. And we're going to discuss them um, right now. So he said, I would, def I would then define the theory of culture as the study of relationships between elements in a whole way of life. The analysis of culture is the attempt to discover the nature of the organization, which is the complex of these relationships. Analysis of particular works or institutions is, in this context, analysis of their essential kind of organization. The relationships which works or institutions embody as parts of the organization as a whole. You will see that the words that he used to describe analysis of culture is completely different from Levicism. Um, he looks at culture as a more of a, um, as a, what is it, a complex uh, organization and that we need to understand what is going on uh, to be able to understand its culture. Now, again, Levicism is only looking at it as what's the best, the creation or the pursuit of what is best, belonging to um, the best of class. And um, you see, this is a very different approach. So the purpose of cultural analysis is always to understand what culture is expressing the actual experience through which a culture was lived, the important common element, a particular community of experience. And um, here he's using again uh, what is being expressed and uh, referring to a particular community. So in short, it aims to reconstitute what Williams calls this idea of the structure of feeling. By structure of feeling, he means the shared values of a particular group, class, or society. Again, I would like to highlight this idea, this concept of particular um, group of class or society of people, shared values. Yeah, The term is used to describe a discursive structure that works like a collective cultural unconscious. Um, it may sound like an ideology, something that we believe in, something that we do, something that drives um, and motivates us as we go about our life without really thinking about it. So according to him, we can understand this structure of feeling of a specific group or class or a specific culture by reading the text produced by that group. Williams provided an example of reading the 19th century novels to understand the relationship between men and women within an institution of marriage. So for instance, if we would like to understand how um, 
in the 19 or in the 1800s, um, the relationship between people, uh, between men and women in the upper class are different from men and women um, of the working class. We can always look for it, uh, for the interactions, the understanding of it, by reading works from, created for the people at that time. Because the novels, maybe, or the, um, what is it, plays that created for the people at that time will um, contain that structure of feelings, that shared values that they may not articulate verbally, but you can uh, understand by observing it, by looking at it closely, or if we go back to the first week, by applying thick descriptions to understand what was going on. Yeah. So all this and more are presented as examples of a shared structure of feeling, the unconscious and conscious working out in fictional texts of the contradictions of 19th century society. The purpose of cultural analysis is to read the structure of feeling through the documentary record from poems to buildings and dress, fashions, right? So if we want to understand um, this structure of feelings or the shared values or um, the ideology of the people of certain period, according to Raymond Williams, all we need to do is actually to look at their cultural texts and to read them, observe them, uh, pay detailed close attention for you to be able to understand what was like the spirit of that time yeah um, and I think you know for us to understand this then we will always need to understand that um, culture are what we call as the live experience is something that Raymond Williams will also discuss when he's talking about the three levels of culture now, before we go talking about the three level of cultures, I do want to have a quick exercise. And I do need you to have a Hulu count for this. So what I want you to do is to actually watch two episodes of Abbott Elementary on Hulu and try to find the structure of feelings of the roles of teachers in public school in 2022. If last week I assigned you to watch Downton Abbey, which was uh, the setting of the early 1900s, late 1800s, now I want to take you to 2022 and to look at these characters, these uh, teachers who are portrayed in this TV series. And I want you to pay attention to what are the tensions and the conflicts that exist between the more seasoned and the newer teachers. What are the unconscious and conscious values that were articulated in this series? So I want you to take notes for yourself and we will discuss them in class on Monday. Um, this is, I want you to approach it as a fun, uh, what is it, exercise. Um, and we can talk about it more on Monday. And I hope it will be a great break um, in between writing papers and taking quiz. All right, now that we have discussed this idea of um, structure of feelings, I would like to move on to his concepts of uh, the three levels of culture. So the first one is what we call as the live culture um, or culture as experienced by people in their day-to-day -day existence in a particular place and at a particular moment in time. The only people who have full access to this culture are those who actually lived its structure of feelings. In other words, for us to be able, so in other words, we are the people who can understand and really live the structure of feelings of 2022. And we do this by going about our daily activities, by uh, going to school, by um, hanging out with, with our friends, by writing our assignments, by um, having dinner with our close friends, by going out, skiing, uh, mountain biking, hiking, whatever it is that you do, yeah, that is only happening 
at this moment in time and you're the person who's living it versus what we considered as the recorded culture the the recorded culture are um, basically what we see what we watch from art to the most everyday facts the culture of a specific period and i'm going to take you to the 1980s for instance um the tv series that they watch the uh movies that they watch the comic books that they read um the car that they drove the kind of fashions that uh, that they wore were different from 2022 and uh we were able to know what was going on in the 1980s through the recorded uh what is it movies or uh literature or plays or whatever it is that we watch that has the setting of the 1980s yeah so the spirit of the 1980s are going to be different from the spirits or the structure of feelings of 2022 um and the factor is actually the one that connects lived culture and period culture so um for us to be able to say that uh, right now we're using specific types of laptops, specific types of uh, cell phones, specific style of you know driving specific types of cars, we should understand that those cannot exist without the creations um, of what was going on in the 1980s. There's always going to be that residual spirits um, of creations um and values from the 1980s that is continuing to the 2022 even though our version is completely different but what we see what we consume what we use today were part of that um culture that existed in that specific period of time and um within this understanding of the three levels of culture is the key concepts of tradition selection and interpretation right because did we or are we able to actually uh see understand watch everything that was produced in the 1980s i don't think so we may have been able to selectively watch specific shows specific um what is it comic books for instance or uh read specific novels that were written at the time but we couldn't exactly know and understand everything about that period what we are able to consume are usually based on the selection uh probably pointed to us by our professors or our teachers who say that in order for you to understand this concept you need to read this books published in the 1980s for instance so in other words there is this ideas of tradition selection and interpretation for us to be able to understand the period culture or the recorded culture um, and see how it's significant to our own lived culture at this moment so he said that within a given society selection will be governed by many kinds of, of special interests including class interests just as the actual social situation will largely govern contemporary selection so the development of the society the process of historical change will largely determine the selective tradition the traditional culture of a society will always tend to correspond to its contemporary system of interests and values for it is not an absolute body of work but a continual selection and interpretation yeah and so what he means by saying it like that is that um what we considered as important right now um are all based on the selections of what was considered as important previously as well and what or who were able to say that this is important or this matters are basically a specific group of people and usually the tastes that are developed today uh, represent specific tastes of people that hold power over what we considered as good selection 
good interpretation. I hope I'm making sense here. Um, if you do have any questions about it, feel free to ask me on Monday as well. So by understanding William's ideas of structure of feelings as well as his uh, three levels of culture, um, he actually breaks with Livicism in a number of ways. Number one is that there is no special place for high culture arts, according to Williams. Um, he believes that art is there as an activity with the production, the trading, the politics, the raising of families. It is ordinary. It does not occupy a space different from other human activities. Culture is a way of life. It is the lived experience of ordinary men and women made in their daily interaction with the text and practices of everyday life. When culture is no longer seen as the best or belonging to the best, that he finally breaks decisively with Livicism. And here is the basis for a democratic definition of culture. Yeah. So again, he uh, says that art is just part of life. It's not something that uh, you should put on pedestal. It's, um, you know, it's ordinary. And so is culture. Culture does not only belong to a specific group of people, but culture belongs to everyone. It's actually about our lived experience um, and how we express it. And although he still claims to recognize how bad most pop culture is, this is no longer a judgment made from within an enchanted circle of certainty pleased by the older formula of enlightened minority and degraded mass. Yeah, so he doesn't look at it from above, looking down and say that, oh, all pop culture are just um, mass culture. They are created just to entertain this simple-minded working class people that do not have any taste, nor do they able to discern what is bad from what is good. Yeah, No, he doesn't look at it from that perspective, though he understand that the reason why pop culture is bad was because it's produced by a um, certain class of people who have the means and who created this uh, pop culture for the people that they believe don't have the capacity <laughs> to, what is it, differentiate between good and bad and who do not have the capacity to understand what good taste is. Now, that's not true, according to him, uh, even though pop culture mostly are mostly bad, but these uh, people, this group of people are not consuming it passively. They're like we talk about when we're talking about Hoggart's work, they actually put meanings to it and they put a lot of creativity to it and make it as their own. So um, no longer are, what is it, popular culture is criticized from this, um, what is it, high level of, oh, this low level, what is it, products are are so bad because they're consumed by the working class people. So the perspective is different. Now that we have talked about Raymond Williams' work, I do want to move on and talk about E.P. Thompson, the making of the work, English working class. Um, he was not actually specifically talk about culture, but he does talk about history of the um, English working class. And his work contributes to cultural studies because it helps people to understand that history is not only about the winning side or the people who have the means, but history is about, again, everyday lives of people, including the working class people. So according to Thompson, class is not an object or a thing. It is always a historical relationship of unity and difference, uniting one class as against another class or classes. The common experience of class is largely determined by the productive relations into which men are born or enter involuntarily. Yeah, so the he here, just by uh, listening to the word or reading the words that he used, you can understand that he was so influenced by uh, Marxism. And we're going to talk about Marxism um, in the next chapter. So I'm going to not go deep here, but just want you to be aware of how he perceived class 
um, with that perspective of Marxism. So classes for Thompson uh, is a social and cultural formation arising from processes which can be studied as they work themselves out over a considerable historical period. Yeah. So for him, you need to understand for him, class is just not an object or a thing. It is always a historical relationship yeah, of unity and difference. So you're able to differentiate from one group over the other. Yeah, Uniting one class as against one another, against another class or classes. So we will always see there's the tension that happens uh, between one class versus another class, according to Thompson. So the making of the English working class is the, cl uh, the classic example of history from below. Thompson's aim is to place the experience of the English working class as central to any understanding of the formation of an industrial capitalist society in the decades leading up to the 1830s. It is a history from below in the double sense suggested by Gregor McLellan, a history from below in that it seeks to reintroduce working class experience into the historical process, and a history from below in that it insists that the working class were the conscious agents of their own making. So they're not, they're definitely not dumb. They know what they're doing and um, they have, they hold certain powers into shaping um, who they are. So uh, in other words, Thompson are basically assigning a lot of agency uh, towards the working class. They're not the victims, but they're taking active roles in their parts or in their uh, parts of a society of the um, Great Britain at that time. So why Thompson work matters. Thompson writing is significant for the student of pop culture in its nature of its historical account. Thompson's history is not one of abstract economic and political processes, nor is it an account of the doings of the great and the worthy. Yeah. So history, according to him, is not only about the great and the worthy or only about economics or uh, politics. The book is about ordinary men and women, their experiences, their values, their ideas, their actions, their desires. In short, pop culture as a site of resistance to those in whose interest the Industrial Revolution was made. Isn't it fascinating? That word ordinary comes up again and um, trying to democratize this idea of culture not only belong to a specific group of people, but also uh, saying even more progressively, saying that pop culture is a site of resistance, yeah, where uh, people make meanings and uh, people have agencies to interpret um, of the whatever works that they're reading or they're consuming. Stuart Hall calls it the most seminal work of social history of the post-war period, pointing to the way it challenges the narrow elitist conception of culture enshrined in the Livicet uh, tradition. So yeah, even though Thompson is not, is considered more of a historian, he was actually included as the foundings of cultural studies uh, because of the revolutionary way um, his work actually informed the work of Richard Hoggart, Raymond Williams, um, Stuart Hall, and so on. Now, speaking of Stuart Hall, um, I know that we discuss about him and Patty Wonnell's um, writing the popular arts in this chapter. But I also do want to give him a much more in-depth, um, what is it, uh, information about who he is and how he was very influential in the shaping of cultural studies. So this is just an introduction to his early thinking. And as we will see towards the or, you know later part of the semester, that his thinking is also changing um, with the, with the, with time, basically. So part of the aim of the popular arts is to replace the misleading generalizations of earlier attacks on pop culture by helping to facilitate 
popular discrimination within and across the range of pop culture itself. And I hope you understand that the word discrimination here is um, referring to this idea of being able to differentiate yeah, within and across the range of pop culture. So according to Hall and Wannell, instead of worrying about the effects of pop culture, we should be seeking to train a more demanding audience. So instead of saying that pop culture is just debasing, um, what is it, or numbing human minds because they're not created with this higher purpose uh, in mind, but instead it's just there to entertain, um, instead of blaming on the product, we should actually demand that the people who consume it yeah, should be seeking, um, what is it, training so that they can ask for much better quality uh, culture. So their approach leads them to reject two common teaching strategies often encountered when pop culture is introduced into the classroom. First, there is the defensive strategy that introduced pop culture in order to condemn it as a second-rate culture. That says, look at this um, video or look at these novels. Are they, you know, not worthy because they're so bad because of the words that they use or the aesthetic that they use or whatever? Um, so there's that defensive strategy just so that students will start to leave this um what they called as the uh, pop culture that's not worthy of attention to uh, diverting their, uh, what is it, focus to high culture products that are more worthy of their attention. Second, there is the opportunist strategy that embraces the pop taste of students in the hope of eventually leading them to better things. So by saying that, trying to appease that, yes, that pop culture can be you know, uh, consume, but maybe there are other better things that you should consider, for instance. So at that time, uh, teachers who brought pop culture to the classroom are either for criticizing it or to, uh, to criticize it or to make the students more aware of other opportunities of much better culture out there. And I hope you understand that I did not use either of those strategies for my class, but that was what is going on and what was discussed by Stuart Hall. So where Hall and Wannell do break significantly with Livicism is in advocating training in critical awareness, not as a means of defense against popular culture, but as a means to discriminate between what is good and what is bad within pop culture. So this is a move that was to lead to a, a decisive break with Livicism when the ideas of Hull and Wannell and those of Hoggart, Williams and Thompson were brought together at the Birmingham University Center for Contemporary, Contemporary Cultural Studies. We'll talk about it some more uh, on Monday, but I think for today, um, this is a brief explanation of Williams, Thompson's, and Stuart Hall and Paddy Wano, and how they um, basically help us to have a more democratic understanding of what culture is. Okay, I hope this explanation, this mini lecture, helps you to think about the concepts that you want to write for your own critical response paper. And I look forward to seeing you all on Monday in class. Thank you.